Okay, where do you want to? St- Should we start with Luke Pierce telling Finn Smith to hurry up? And we, Luke, we love you. Yeah, I love you, and I do like the five, four, three, the countdown on the box kicks that you brought into the game yeah. on Friday night under the lights at Franklin's Gardens, Northampton versus Sarries. I didn't like you telling Finn Smith to hurry up the kick. Like he didn't need to hurry up the kick. Like I know there's a shot clock. He didn't, he didn't need to do that, Luke. But out of all the decisions, all the refs at the weekend, you were probably the best again, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had a bit of back and forth with Luke. And as you know, and as everyone knows, I've got a lot of time for him. Love him to bits. Great referee. Um, and he's like, who wants to sit there and watch a kicker just standing looking at a ball? Yes, there's a shot clock. He's like, we've got a responsibility to speed the game up, make it more entertaining. And I agree with him. Like, I, I, I get the shot clock's there. And then you bring in the spirit of the game. Is it in the spirit of the game to stand there and waste time with the shot clock? What does the spirit of the game mean? I don't understand this, bollocks. I just I just don't get it. Sorry, Luke. Well, the spirit of the game. The spirit, what does that the mean? The spirit of the game, well, they're, they're, they're winning pretty comfortably at the time, Northampton are. He's got a conversion straight in front of the sticks. And he's within his rights to stand there and just let the clock go down and down and down and down and down. I saw one a few years ago um, in the top 14. And it was to win a game. It might have been Ruin Pinar. And it looked awful. He's just letting the shot clock go down to three seconds. To, so the time at the end of the game goes over 80 minutes. They He kicks it. They win the game. Game over. And I get it. It's gamesmanship. It's playing to the laws. Um, but I've had some back and forth with Luke about it. And he... It, He's basically saying to me, we've got a responsibility to make it as exciting as we can and standing there, letting the time dwindle off when there's just an easy conversion to take. I suppose it's there. The shot clock is there for pure time wasting, you know, in a, or if the ball gets lost or, you know, celebrations were too rigorous or something like that. But for me, I thought he was right. Just get on with it. Take the conversion. I did say to him, would you have said it to Faz if it was either way around? And Luke came back to what me. He, he goes, "Yeah, hundred percent. No, 100%, no. 100%, <laughs> sorry, Faz. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I would have, but Faz probably wouldn't have kicked it. So I don't know. Listen, that's not the biggest issue in the game. I like that issue because he's trying to speed the game up, make it more entertaining. But just on Luke, Andrew, and me and you know, and so does Luke that rules are rules. When we were down in Exeter and he's buffalo to drink, yeah." We've told him. And he did it. Luke, that's a buffalo. He did it. Now, rules is rules. And he's done, and he did it quick as well. You know, there was no arguing. It was like, Jim, Goody, the rules are the rules. So regardless of my missus or his missus agreeing with him chopping apart unresponsibly, he had to do it. And it's the same as Finn Smith. If, he, if there's a minute to go, take the minute, mate. The rules are the rules, like Michael Holford said. <laughs> yeah. And you need to abide by them. So Luke... All right, I love you. Out of all the, I'm going to call it blunders of the weekend, it was minimal, but you need to be called out on that and you'll be chopping a pint next time we see uh, yeah, you. Yeah, I'm going to defend him. I'll chop a pint for him because I'm, I'm all right with it. Speeding up the game. There's no need for it. I've been there for a conversion where you just don't need to waste time to get on with it. But there we go. Andrew, there is no chance you would have hurried the kick. There is not a chance in hell you would have done that. You would have probably turned around and said, Luke, I've got a minute, brother. You wait. Yeah, but I wouldn't have been silly enough to get the ball in the tee as quickly as possible. I'd have, I'd have been still trying to get the ball out of the stands from the fans or whatever. So there's different ways of doing it. Once it's on the tee, I don't agree with just staring at the clock and looking at it and, and letting time go. But we disagree on that, Jim. But that's not the biggest talking point of the week from the refereeing circles. Andrew, before we get into the other ones, we maybe just kind of piggyback the referee TMO chats with the games. Yeah. Big shout out to Saints. Mentioned under the lights on Friday against... Saracens, almost fully loaded. Well, they were fully loaded. Maratoji, the only one that wasn't playing. Saints bounced back against a comfortable win for Bristol down there, like we've seen across the Prem all weekend. Saracens smoked Harlequins in the game at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. And look, this is the thing, right? And we can go through the games, Goody. You can see how emotionally you need to be at that level every single week and it's almost an impossible thing to do off the back of the six nations coming back into prem rugby two weeks of that and then into the champions cup if you're in the round of 16 which saracens clearly are but northampton looked sensational saracen slightly off big yeah. shout out to northampton yeah, fin, wicked. finn smith was class um people said the week before owen farrell absolutely schooled marcus smith well this time, uh, Finn Smith scored Owen Farrell, if that's the case. Uh, Saints were great. 
offloading game Dingwall was good they scored a wonderful try from Tommy Freeman just little hands around the corner Finn Smith fixes straightens up it was class from Saints but Saracens fought back they got two bonus points a losing one and four tries which in the grand scheme of things as we carry on At the, the running yeah, yeah, that, they're going to that. be massive absolutely massive for them so um, yeah good from Saints very good powerful uh, the opposite of what they were down at Bristol the week before. Um, but Sarri's blessed, isn't it? A six-day turnaround. Does make a difference. Six-day turnaround as well. Yeah, does make yeah, a difference. Does. And that's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. Trying to get to their emotional levels on a six-day turnaround off the back of a Six Nations. It's a thing. And yeah, imagine if you're La Rochelle and having tra- travelled down to South Africa. Look, let's leave it. I'm not going to get negative. <laughs> but yeah, kudos to Saints. Kudos to Saints and to Sarri's. Um there we go. Where should we go next? Should we go to the other Friday night game, Jim, and the 100-minute game between Newcastle Falcons and Leicester, my old clubs? Mm, let's do it. Oh, my scrums. Oh, my scrums. It was carnage. Leicester, I've done exceptionally well to hang on for a ridiculous amount of time in that second half and when the clock goes into the red for about 20 minutes with all the yellow cards they got. It was going on for that long that some of the players that got yellow carded when it was over 80 minutes came back on, Jim. They came, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Carl Dixon was the referee. Newcastle messed up a little bit um, and, and they've improved hugely under Steve Diamond. So we've got to give them a shout out and Dimes has done very good things in a short space of time. They were good down at Exeter last week. A couple of errors cost them. Uh, this week they could have and probably should have beaten Leicester. Uh, they just kept taking scrum after scrum after scrum, which as you know, eats up the clock. Um, and, you know, it ended up being a 100-minute game. And fair play to Leicester. They defended like their season depended on it, really, because it did. If they didn't get the win up at Newcastle, their top four chances were probably gone. And he comes on the pod, Finn Carnduff. Friend of the friend show. Of the show comes yeah, friend on, of the show. Comes off the bench up at Newcastle. There was a few youngsters on the bench for Leicester, and he gets the penalty. It was... The commentators gave it to Jasper Visa, but I watched it and I'm basically saying it's Finn Carnduff because he came on the pod that won the penalty at the end. But a rear guard action defensively by Leicester, some try saving tackles. Newcastle have improved hugely under uh, Steve Diamond. They scored an absolute worldie of a try off first phase uh, from Ben Redshaw up the middle, split the centres. Um, but Leicester do what they do. He went back to type. Julian Montoya scores a driving line out. Um, Jack Van Portfleet, great to see him back. He scored a good try as well. A little snipe. Yeah, scored a good uh, try, yeah. And a step. So um, with his foot injury that we saw just before the World Cup, you know, great to see JVP back. Um, but Leicester just did enough really. And then the madness of three yellow cards, about 20 minutes of uh, time in the red clock. Uh, but Leicester held on and it wasn't, I, th- I thought, Carl Dixon handled it really well because he people are like he should have given a penalty try but all the penalties were from 25 metres out scrum penalties and they were dominating them at scrum time um, so they had scrum penalties they had a couple of offsides and a, a entry into a ruck but nothing where you can give a penalty try to win a game um, but he just had to keep giving Well penalties. you say that Andrew with some of the decisions we've seen this weekend like he could have given a penalty try from the halfway line <laughs> if there was a knock on well, yeah. in the break. <laughs> anything goes. Too right? harsh. Anything, Sorry. Anything goes. Anything goes. But I thought Carl Love Dixon it. handled that really well. So we'll give referees kudos where they deserve it. But yeah, Leicester um, battling qualities. They've got another battle this weekend. But more drama on Saturday, wasn't there? Where are we going Saturday? Should we go right into the heart of the drama? Let's go. Let's go. Quinns, Quinns. against Bath. Quinns Bath. I mean... Let's, do Let's it. start off with how good Quinns were in that first half. Bath were playing touch. Um, Quinns ripped them to pieces. You know, everything that they weren't against Saracens the week before, they were on against Bath. They were physical in defence. They were winning collisions both sides of the ball. Esther Hazen with his new lid just sprouting through. He was running over boys for fun. and he scored a good try for line out. Marcus Smith with a bit of magic, the chip and chase, regather scores. And everything was going perfectly for Bar. Uh, everything was going perfectly for Quinns. Um, you know, there were I think there was something like 40 points to three up. Uh, Bath went in the game. They were making errors. Discipline was poor, losing the collisions, losing the kick battle massively. Um you know, Tyrone Green was out of this world good at times. Oh, do you ever watch Tyrone Green closely or not? 
Is he someone that you watched him? Yes. Right, I watch him closely and every week... I like watching him. Yeah, I love him as a player. I think he's really good. But every week, I think the way he runs and walks, I think his leg's going to snap off. And he's always got one leg heavily taped and he's quick, he's elusive. But sometimes I'm like, his, his knee's fucked or there's something seriously wrong with him. And then he rips out an unbelievable break, a step, his pace. Um, and he's a brilliant player. And Quinns were flying, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They look good. Marlow was on the bench. Oh, maybe that's why. And shout out as well. On, I know, on, I'm joking. No, no, no. But, I'm joking. But genuinely, Finn Baxter, who came in for Marlow, and I, I don't know yeah. whether the Quinns coaches listened to the pod last week and watched Joe Marlow's performance and said, you know, a lot of how shit we were was down to Marlow being Marlow uh, and acting the fool. They dropped him to the bench. Finn Baxter was unbelievable. He looks good. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, looks about 14. Yeah. But he's good. Physical, yeah, physical he's though. Made some hits. But that's the thing with Quinns, and again, it's easy to say this now, but you could say this around Saris, you could say it around Bath, because they were so good last week, and they were poor this week. Bath, and I'm going to say Saris as well, they weren't that poor, but Bath were really poor for the first half. Six-day turnaround. But Quinns, they are up and down, aren't they? Yeah, six-day turnaround as well, so there's a lot in the mix that you can talk about. But Quinns, when they're on, they're on, aren't they? But they have got an Achilles heel, and that is clearly a mental Achilles heel. You look at last week against Saris, like how you don't get up for that game at the Tottenham Stadium and how you nearly let Bath in, not to win the game, but do you know what I mean? As in to score a bonus point try after getting the pants pulled down in that first half. It maybe just shows the Achilles heel of where Quinns are. What do you mean when Marla came on, it went Pete Tong for Quinns and Bath scored about four tries? Is that what you mean? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> but no, I'm just saying when there's... When, when there's only seven minutes in bins, like, and this is what can happen. <laughs> yeah, the, the chaos. Yeah. Andrew, what happened there then? So maybe you, d d like, dig in. I mean, it's quite obvious for me what happened, but how does something like that happen in the modern day where you've got about nine referees, touch judges, you've got someone in the TMO van, you've got the commentators that are feeding in. How does something like that go amiss? Well, maybe give the listeners a, some context. Yeah, I mean, Ernie Herbst gets in binned on 63 minutes, right? Uh, play carries on. You know, Bath score a try. Louis Schroeder scores a try. Finn converts it. Herb's got Simbin for not being uh, 10 metres from a, a quick tap penalty. And rightly so. Um, it carries on. Bath are on the, in the ascendancy now attacking. Lewis Liner then gets Simbin for a slap down. Um, and in all the sort of melee of Lewis Liner getting Simbin, they just chuck Ernie Herb's back on. <laughs> and the fourth official, you know, we've seen it. Um, on TV where there's two yellow card clock countdown timers and it gets to four minutes and he's back on the field making tackles. So I've done a bit of digging um, and there's a bit of responsibility on a, on a few people, but mainly the fourth official who he's in charge of Simbins. Um, so it's not necessarily the referee. The referee can't be thinking of how long is the Simbin going on for. The TMO, I think, possibly has a bit of a, a say in it because he can see the clocks. Um, but ultimately, it's a bit of a team effort. Um, and Quinns would know. And this is the thing. The Quinns team manager um, has you know, allowed Herps to go back on. And in, in their defence, if the fourth official saying it's all right, I'm pretty sure every team would just let their player go back on and go, oh, you're not going to say about your own team, oh, he's only had six and a half minutes of his 10 minutes in, but are you? He's just going to say, yeah, if he's good to go on, on you go. So it's a massive cock up, shall we say, uh, by the officiating team, which pretty much is the fourth official who's in charge of that. Um, there were a couple of Simbins and I don't know whether one stop clock. So I don't know whether one stopwatch didn't work, one did. He forgot to press go on one timer. You know what it's like when you're setting a timer or something like that. Maybe he just didn't have enough watches on him um, and they need to get a better watch sponsor as referees. But it's not great, is it? Bath coming back, Ernie Herbs comes back on, makes a few tackles when Bath are really pushing to score more tries. And effectively, I'm not going to say Bath would have won the game, but they end up losing by four points. Ernie Herbs has been simbin for six and a half minutes. He's come on and made a few big impacts in the three and a half minutes when he should have still been on the side of the pitch, um, seeing out his 10 minutes simbin. And ultimately... It's, it looks it looks village, doesn't it? And I said it on Twitter. It looks absolutely village that in this day and age, with all the technology we've got, 
all the referees and we see them all the officials on the sideline they're all trying to keep people in their box don't don't go onto the field don't do this but you can't count on a clock you can't use your clock to count down 10 minutes um, so it's not a good look uh, Quinn's got away with it the statement's come out they've apologised it's another apology um, you know obviously what happened last week they tried to sweep it under the carpet and say with Stuart Terridge that it was uh, it was checked before, so it wasn't a reactionary, but we all know it was a reactionary. I can't call it up now because Austin said it on comms. But this week, they've come out, said it's a, a mistake. They apologised. And there is human error. Listen, people make errors, but if you've got one job to count down how long 10 minutes is for in a sim bin, even if there's two boys in the sim bin, you better do it properly. So um, the result stands. Bath, you know, I'm, I'm sure Van Graham has... And he has made his feelings known, um, but there's nothing they can do about it now. What, it has to be a massive learning for the game. It can never happen again, um, you know, in this age of professionalism and how it is. Um, you know, you just can't make those errors and it's a really bad look, but one that unfortunately everyone just has to move on from. Shall I read the official statement? Go on then, Jim. Hello. <laughs> Does it say we would hello? like to apologise. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying that. Maybe that's how I think that they'll speak, but maybe it's a bit harsh. <laughs> hello. We would like to apologise to both teams for this mistake, said the RFU Professional Game Match Officials Team, also known as the PGMOT. That's what they said in the statement. They need a fucking as MOT. In the usual process, the PGMOT will review all games to ensure continued improvement and learnings that continued bit was just like I added on that kind of continued yeah. as in that's how they would have said it who knows who knows I don't think we should be talking about this stuff now especially where we are as a game um, off the back of the size of the World Cup but I, and why do I say that I mean because of like how big the game is now yeah. how big it's got and again you point towards other sports like sorry NFL where there's a load going on there's loads of different rules and loads of stuff happening loads of players on and off the pitch timeouts and all these kind of crazy things does it happen in games like that does it matter now in rugby because I agree with you Quinns were winning that game comfortably um, so it didn't have as much kind of jeopardy on it but we don't want to get to a point do we where you're in a knockout game or a game that's closer yeah of more importance however you want to look yeah. at it and there's too many of these creeping in now and I feel for the refs and stuff because there is a lot going on like there's a lot to consume with rugby the stuff with Austin on commentary last week and the TMO listening in it's th th there's a lot and there's so much pressure on the referees on the TMOs on the assistants and the social media pressure straight after the game during the game when it's ongoing it just adds doesn't it but we need to get to a point where they're razor sharp of understanding of of what's going on and, and stuff like this doesn't happen. Yeah. So I've been saying it on uh, here for years. Good. TMO Goody. I, I mean, I'd do a job. I would do a job as long as there's plenty of biscuits. Are you keen for that or not? Yeah, mate, I'd do it. It's not, I mean, the problem is... How much? Like, that, that's the first question, how much? Uh, second question is, can I fit it in around my other work and family? Um, and, uh, and listen, you know, I tip my hat to them. They are away from home a hell of a lot. They work exceptionally hard. Um... You know, the TMOs aren't necessarily as full-time and the fourth officials aren't necessarily as full-time as some of the other match officials. Maybe the RFU need to just pump more money into it and give them all full-time jobs and that's the way to improve things. Um, so, it, I mean, it's a big part of the game. Like some people are like, oh, it doesn't matter, let's not talk about it. You have to talk about it because a lot of refereeing decisions this weekend impacted games and, you know, there's a massive one on Sunday as well, um, which we'll come on to in a bit. But, um, yeah, it's it, they've got to get better week on week, and that must be a thing that the RFU pump out regularly uh, because they've said it in that statement, haven't they? Um, and they will get better, and hopefully we won't be talking about this again. But you do need to talk about it when things like this happen, unfortunately. But Quinns were good, yeah. So see, I finished on a yeah positive. There. Yeah, they were, um, and they took their foot off the gas a little bit. Bath came back. Uh, Alfie Barbary was good in that second half. Um, you know, Finn started producing a bit of magic and off they went. So, yeah, two massive bonus points for Bath in the grand scheme of things as well with the four tries and the losing bonus point as well. So that's the same as what Saracen's got. Um, and it keeps Bath in second spot, um, which, you know, we've always seen in the run-ins and we've always seen 
semi-finals, the majority of semi-finals are won by the home team, aren't they, in the Premiership? So huge two points for Bath. When your pants are around your ankles, your skids are on show, 40 points to three down. To fight back like that, they've done exceptionally well. There was another one in the Gloucester-Bristol game that not many people have picked up on. I saw it. Go on then, TMO. Go on then, Andrew. Let's get let's peel yeah. back. Get to, get to <laughs> that one. Well, first and foremost, shout out to Bristol, the only team that have gone two from two since the return in the Premiership. Um, Gloucester, as we know, had a good win up at Leicester last Friday. Local derby at King's home. Worldy of a finish in the first half from Hathaway for Gloucester. I mean, you talk about Lewis Reese, Zamet and Wheels, this kid Hathaway, Josh Hathaway, 10 minutes in, out and out speed. I'm not saying he's faster than Lewis Reese, Zamet, but he was pretty quick uh, and it was a great finish. Um, and <sighs> Bristol are playing some really good rugby, right? Gloucester were on fire. Santi Carreras gets an intercept. Um, you know, Gloucester were going really well. And then you get to the second half when it starts getting tighter. You look at the scoreline, it ends up 33-24 to Bristol. There's a huge try on 66 minutes from Magnus Bradbury. Uh, and it's a really good try, but it's illegal to start off with. So, so Fitz Harding picks up the ball from a ruck and makes a break up the middle of the field. But he picks it up from an offside position straight in front of the ref. Um, and it leads to a big break, a couple of offloads, and Magnus Bradbury goes over in the corner, a pivotal moment of the game, right? I've watched the replay. He's offside where he picks the ball up from, and out is straight in front of the referee. Ari hasn't seen that, so Gloucester fans were raging with it. Bristol, too good. Um, you know, it's a minor point, but it's still a big point, I think, um, when it's led straight to a try. It was one of those ones where, you know, you used to see boys stood at the front of a ruck, pick the ball up from way behind them, and then run through. That got outlawed. Um, so you have to be behind the ball, picking the ball up. Fitz Harding picks the ball up with his feet in front of the ball. So he's in an offside position, um, makes the break and it wasn't really looked at. So detail again, minor detail for some people, but a major detail if you're a Gloucester fan. Uh, but Bristol were good. Yancey van Rensburg at centre, worldy of performance. Apparently he qualifies for England in a couple of years. Um but, you know, he scored a try, um, sat people down for fun. Bristol have, have spent the last six or seven weeks working really hard. They've still got a sniff of top four, two from two, big win at Gloucester. Uh, they look good. Some lovely offloading. Shout out to ex-Wasp Gabriel Ogre as well. He scored a world of a try, great footwork. Um, but yeah, again, another referee in error at a crucial moment in the game, I think, that led to a Bristol try. But they deserve the win, Jim. Uh, and then Sunday, Jim. Should we get on to Sunday? Go on, let's do it. Where do you want to go? Well, there's only one game for me on Sunday, and that was Sale taking on Exeter. Uh, and Sale were very good. Oh, that was the only game. It's the only game. Hey, it was the only game. It was. <laughs> it was the only game. It was. Sale were very good. Uh, powerful, um, physical, offloading game was class. Direct. Um, yeah, but they, they've they added, you know, I think they get pigeonholed a little bit with just being this big physical South African team with Manu and a few big lads. But they actually... Oh, they are. They, they, yeah, they've got that in them. Of course they have. But also, they had some deft touches at the weekend. Roebuck scores a hat-trick, um, some really nice handling. Yeah, a big fan of him, yeah. by the way. He's a big, big lad. Big fan of him. He's a big lad as well. Um, so, yeah, listen, uh, they were very dominant and Exeter were error-strewn, Poorly disciplined, um, some silly penalties gave away. But I've got another beef with the ref. Another beef. Oh, gosh. Hamish smells. He doesn't smell, but Hamish smells. He looks like you. No, he doesn't. Is that he, your beef? Because no, he looks he like looks you. He looks nothing like <laughs> Yes, he, he does. Looks, Andrew, he's got a massive penalty Hamish spot on the top snail. of his head. Massive penalty looks like spot you. on hey, the did, top of his head. But that's fine. But that, and that, that, that isn't just how you look alike. That isn't it. That, just the fact that he's got a penalty spot where he's not invested in getting that fixed. Yeah. And remember, if you go back a few years, he knows about it as well. Because yeah, when yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the wide camera went on top, he put his hand on top of his head. I feel <laughs> you pain, brother. Okay, that's fine. Andrew, if there is anyone in our rugby fraternity that you look like, there is no one closer okay. anywhere I'll take in, it. in our rugby family. Poor bloke. Any, you'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you look like Hamish Snails. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, poor bloke. Okay. Poor bloke looking like me. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Luke Pierce was on the touch. Um, first half, Manu slaps the ball down. Penalty for a knock, deliberate knock on. Right, and I'm all right with that. If it's if that's you know if that's what it is, that's what it is. 
Then later in the first half, Josh Hodge goes to the ball with two hands to catch it. And they call a deliberate knock-on and give him a yellow card. And people might be like, well, yeah, there was going to be a line break. Well, there was going to be a line break on Manu's one as well, but it was further down the field. Um, and I just have issues with consistency. And this is what the refs, you know, it's a tough job, but this is what people would always say. We just want consistency. So Manu slaps the ball down in the first half, just gets a penalty given against him. And later on in the first half, Josh Hodge goes for a ball, that's floated over the top with two hands. Um, he gets done for a deliberate knock-on yellow card. Sale scored two tries in probably exactly the positions that he'd have been in had he not been simbined. Uh, they scored one out on the width just before half-time. Uh, and Sale were comfortable. Listen, I ain't saying that Exeter would have won the game. They wouldn't, but it made it. That decision from the refereeing team, the TMO, um, Hamish smells the ref, Luke Pierce was on the touch um, to give Hodge a yellow card uh, when they didn't give one for Manu um, just doesn't add up for me. And, you know, they scored a tryout on the width just before half time where Hodge would have been defending. And then just after half time, Robot gets one where they put a box kick up. Hodge would have been in that zone to compete. But um, unfortunately for Exeter, it was Stu Townsend, who's about three foot tall, that doesn't get off the deck. And Robot takes it over his head and goes on to score the try. And that was a big difference in the game. 14-point swing off a yellow card that when you've had an identical, probably a worse infringement from Manu to Alangi deliberately slapping it down earlier in the first half to not give a yellow card to him, but then give one to Hodge. Um, it just leaves a bit of a bit of taste. And X haven't complained about it. Of course, they haven't. They got hosed. Uh, and Sale were very good and deserved a win. But again, uh, a poor decision from me to give a yellow card to Hodge and not to Manu. If you give both yellow cards, not a problem. Or if you just give both penalties, not a problem. And I felt for Hodge because he's gone after it to try and catch it. But then it does look like a bit of a goalie slate. It does look like a bit of a goalie save tipping it over the bar. Um, but it, again, it had an impact on the game. Sale class, um, they win that game every day of the week, how both teams rocked up. But they were given a helping hand from a decision from the referee or a lack of a decision from the referee uh, and inconsistencies that helped them that way. But shout out to Roebuck, first ever hat-trick. Um, uh, I thought he was brilliant. Uh, Manu was firing pretty well. Uh, Luke Kowansik, he played well against his old team. They looked powerful. The Dupree boys were banging everything that came their way. And yeah, those Curry boys, uh, I know Tom's out injured, but Ben was back from injury. How good was he? Like, they are so strong. Absolute freaks of nature, those two. Sitting boys down, uh, ball in hand, uh, and it was only Ben playing. But whoever's playing, whoever's a Curry twin, whenever they don, whatever jersey they don, they are freaks. Smashing boys, chopping boys, carrying hard. Uh, and Ben Curry certainly had a, a, a worldy performance. Pod, 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 pod. Rugby pod.